So, good afternoon, uh, Core. How are you? Uh, welcome to a webinar on ramp up and recovery uh, for the research program at your universities. This again is taking place uh, in replacement of our normal core weekly call. Uh, and I wanted to say that we are uh, delighted to have such a very large community, very interested uh, in this topic at this time. I wanted to uh, give a special thanks uh, to Roger Wakimoto and Randy Katz for being uh, leads on this team and this discussion today. So thank you very much. Uh, and then also uh, Mark McClellan and Faith Hawkins uh, for helping lead this discussion today. Uh, so we greatly appreciate everybody's time today to have this conversation. Uh, and then all of the members of CORE who've been engaged in this conversation, we've been talking about this uh, in many different forms now. So we really greatly appreciate everybody from CORE uh, talking and uh, to discussing this topic. Also special thanks to the APLU staff to make this webinar possible. Uh, our event staff, Winston Savoy and Kaylin Jackson, uh, have been working uh, nonstop, making sure everyone's properly registered and the uh, webinar goes smoothly. Also special thanks to Nalijah Kane, uh, Tia Freelove Kirk and Casey Red, who are a part of the staff for the Council on Research, uh, who also are helping make this happen today. Uh, so, the uh, next week's call again is going to be replaced by a very specific topic that we're going to discuss uh, estimating costs and losses due to COVID 19. So, please mark your calendar for that. You should have gotten a newsletter today with a, a long list of events that you can put on your calendar this morning. So for today, what to expect, again, we're gonna have a 90 minute conversation. We're gonna have about a 30 minute time with our panel to discuss uh, the questions on ramp up and recovery at your university, and then we'll have ample time for questions. You can ask questions at any time using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and then uh, we have disabled the chat function for this uh, webinar so that uh, we can easily monitor questions and discussion. Uh, <clears throat> if you uh, did not get your question answered or if you'd like to continue discussion, you're welcome to do that through the core listserv. Um, also, as part of this conversation, we have created a shared folder for you to upload your uh, reopening plans. Uh, please use that as a place to receive feedback or to share uh, what your campus is doing so we can help refine or develop plans as a group. <clears throat> and without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Roger Wakimoto, the Vice Chancellor of Research at UCLA, and we'll be moderating this discussion today, and he'll introduce the panelists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bethany. And this is uh, a new platform, a, a version of Zoom that I, I learned very quickly. I think it is kind of nifty. I think the only thing maybe, Bethany, you left out is people can't vote on the questions that are posted. So thank we'll try you. to get to the ones that receive the most votes. So I think you'll see the little icon that says like on there. So this is very timely and very important discussion. I think you all know that when research shut down, it amazingly occurred overnight. Uh, across the country. It's like all the lights just suddenly went out. Uh, the reverse is not going to be true. I think this is going to be a process that's going to be over a much longer time frame. It, it'll probably occur in steps. And there's assuredly going to be what I like to call backsliding or backtracking because of, say, positive ca cases that show up on your um, campus. The other thing is, unlike shutting down, which again occurred almost simultaneously across the country, ramp up is likely going to be different across the country because every county, every state is lifting the restrictions uh, on a different time frame. And so we are not going to be coordinated uh, in that sense. Um, we need to create a process that prioritizes, you know, what on-campus activities ramp up first, what personnel come back first, what are the safety and health uh, issues and measures that we have in place. I think these are issues that you all are thinking about. And so that leads me to this panel. It's a three-person panel, and I'm just really uh, fortunate and lucky to have all of them here to talk about the challenges and opportunities in research ramp up. So very quickly, uh, my colleague in the UC system, uh, Randy Katz, he's the Vice Chancellor for Research at Berkeley. He, along with uh, another one of my colleagues, Sam Trainer at UC Merced, 
uh, put together a guiding principles document that uh, I know a lot of people, I mean, I do mean a lot, have requested. I, I believe Randy will have uploaded it to the shared document. It, I've sort of jokingly said it could have made the New York Times bestseller list because of how many VPRs and VCRs requested it. He's going to be talking, giving a, basically an overview of sort of the guiding principles in that document. Uh, I think many of you know Mark McCullough, the Vice President of Research at the University of uh, North Texas. Uh, we've asked Mark to talk about the safety and health considerations because we are entering into what will be a hazardous work environment. Uh, for some of the people that have asked me, I said, well, you can sort of think of this as a variation of a chemistry lab with volatile chemicals, which means it is hazardous. But I mean, the good news is if you put the proper safety measures in, it is manageable. And so Mark is going to be talking about issues that we need to be concerned about. And finally, but not, uh, not by least by any measures, we have Faith Hawkins, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Research at UC San Diego. Faith will be talking about a subject that really has not gotten enough attention, even on our APLU discussions, although we do mention it. And that is the non-medical, non-engineering, -me non non-life and physical sciences, basically the arts, humanities, and social sciences and other fields. Uh, this also includes libraries, archives. I think there are performances and exhibits that are supported as part of the, the university. Those people that do that consider that either research or creative activities. That has to be part of the discussion. And we would be very remiss if we didn't include this. So now it is going to be in that order that I just introduced that we'll start. Each panelist has about 10 minutes. So we should have you know, maybe about 50 minutes for questions. I'm feeling pretty comfortable. That's, that's a pretty good chunk of time for you to uh, ask questions. So we'll start first with uh, Randy Katz. You have the, the floor. Thank you, Roger. And, and thanks to all the colleagues who are participating in the webinar today. I apologize a little bit in advance for turning off the video. It's it's uh, not because I haven't had a haircut for eight weeks, but rather that um, I'm trying to conserve some bandwidth uh, to my home connection. I'm sure you all uh, uh, have that, that feeling as well from time to time. So I'd like to bring your attention to the, the uh, draft framework document that we put together, Principles and Framework Guiding a Phased Approach to increasing research activity on our campuses. Uh, it should be available as a PDF uh, snapshot from last Friday uh, on the share drive associated with the, with the webinar. And I just wanna go through that the structure of this document is first to lay out a set of principles. Um, an individual campus may, may choose to uh, include all of the principles, modify them, add their own to guide what amounts to laying out a, a, a statement of what is the priority for the kinds of research activities to bring back to campus in the context of a phased timeline. Now, a lot of the directions that we're getting from the public health authorities have been uh, sort of uh, focused on we're closed and now you can open and maybe you have a plan for something in between but it does seem like, uh, at least in, a, in terms of a more nuanced approach, uh, the public health authorities are gonna direct us to gradually increase the level of activity on our campus uh, for instruction, for research, for other kinds of things. So there's some intermediate states between open and closed, other than you're somewhere in between. And, at least that was something we tried to capture in the document that I'm sharing with you, uh, a conceptual framework for gradually in stages and steps, um, increasing the amount of activity on the campus. And I would like to you know, do a hat uh, tip to the University of Washington, which is really where we got the original idea for the matrix, uh, capturing those phases that you see in this document. So, the overall um, uh, document really starts with some guiding principles. And the first principle is that we're gonna abide by, you know, the directions of the public health authorities. Uh, sometimes they understand higher education. Sometimes it's a more of a blanket directive. Uh, we are fortunate at, in uh, city of Berkeley and Alameda County to be able to work fairly closely with the public health authorities. Um, and to work collaboratively with them to understand exactly what our business of higher education is and what it means for people to return. Um, 
but uh, you know, you may have a different relationship with your public health authorities, but we gotta follow the law. And so that's, that's basically the first principle. The second principle, which of course is extremely important, is to protect the health and safety of our research workforce and the health and safety more broadly of those who come in contact with the university, such as our human subjects and clinical patients. And we will have a robust conversation about those health and safety issues as part of the webinar. The third principle is, I'm sure we're all feeling this on our campuses, the impact that the shutdown has had on the careers of early stage researchers, young faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and so being sensitive as an institution to those uh, impacts, of course, is very important. And the reason I put that down as a principle is that they may, that may help guide some of the prioritization of who should have access to uh, facilities on campus as loosening is allowed to take place. We should be sensitive to the needs of uh, term appointed postdocs, et cetera, who maybe should be given a, a priority for access to, to uh, laboratories and other facilities on campus. Our fourth principle uh, is that undergraduates are students first and researchers second. And this was to guide whether uh, undergraduate research could continue. Um, again, an individual campus may, may choose to think about that in a different context than, than uh, we on the University of California Vice Chancellors for Research uh, came down on this of essentially focusing our research restart on graduate students and postdoctoral researchers um, and, and really for the health and safety reasons, uh, not considering undergraduates as part of the, that research workforce. Other units, other uh, campuses may make a different, may adopt a different principle. A uh, fifth principle is having a fair and transparent process for gaining, granting access. And that's why we come up with this, this sort of prioritization as embedded in our phases uh, so that everybody understands, whether you're a lab scientist or a, a humanist, uh, what the rules of the road are in terms of who gains uh, access to campus as the phases go forward. Principle number six is to ensure as rapid a research restart as possible and captures a set of considerations of uh, when you flick the switch, uh, are those various research activities ready to really restart? Have you considered the supply chain issues? Do you have proper, you know, sort of safety environment in place in order to ensure that uh, research in those spaces on campus can actually restart safely? So number six is related to factoring that into the plan and gating what can and cannot go forward. And principle number seven is, of course, to prioritize activities on our, our campus research community that are being responsive to the COVID-19 uh, emergency right now, uh, whether it is uh, testing uh, for COVID-19 or uh, developing, exploring possible vaccines or other kinds of uh, responses, uh, mechanical engineering of new ventilator designs. There's tremendous creativity across our campuses uh, in general, uh, and those should, be, should enjoy some priority. And so with those principles in place, uh, with much conversation and much feedback from, and fr you know, frankly, the people on this webinar, we developed a, a phased approach uh, it constitutes six phases, and I think it may be my own engineering mindset that likes to, you know, sort of divide things in a very fine grain. I'm aware, and there are some uh, summaries at the end of this document for the restart plans from some of the other UCs, University of California, and also our colleagues at Stanford have, have shared their plan. And they don't always, always adopt six phases. If, if they, people have, have collapsed phases, um, again, when you, when you take this document as a framework and evolve it for an implementation plan for an individual campus, feel free to, you know, don't follow this slavishly, adapt it for, for your local needs and requirements. And maybe you think that uh, Randy as editor-in-chief has over-engineered this a little bit. So um, again, uh, feel free to adapt and adopt as, as makes sense for your local situation. But our, our phase one is really um, the situation with respect to uh, really limiting access to campus to only the most uh, 
uh, critical and uh, uh, sort of lowest level required in order to maintain the research capability of campus. And again, adopted from this University of Washington uh, matrix that we started with, the phases go up as there's more loosening with an awareness that uh, if public health conditions uh, evolve to such a state where we need to shut down again, that you would move sort of up through the phases as loosening takes place, and then down through the phases towards lower phases if you need to because of the public health directive. So it's a two-way up and down kind of thing. And it captures as one of the columns there, the external conditions which are you know, ever increasingly being articulated as to what constitutes the criteria for either loosening or, or tightening up uh, in, in terms of testing capability, PPE availability, uh, uh, what the, the current situation is with respect to critical care in the local health system, we're getting a lot of figures of merit that help inform whether or not you can advance or, do, or go backwards uh, with respect to the phases. So the first phase is only critical research allowed. Second phase uh, increases the number and at level of activity on the campus, but in a prioritized and controlled fashion uh, in order to uh, really now engage things like that high priority COVID-19 research. And we try and, and sort of assess these things based on a, a sort of level of how it compares to normal business as usual levels of activity on our campus. And so the first phase is order five to 10% of normal, um, just really maintenance, uh, access to check on equipment, uh, to ensure that, that the research capability continues, uh, keeping the animal colonies alive, ensuring that germ lines are maintained, things of that nature. Whereas phase two allows you to have high priority activities uh, uh, in the research spaces on campus with COVID-19 related research being an exemplar. And that grows us to maybe a third of normal normal activity. And then phase three is, uh, allows us to expand that priority to time sensitive um, kinds of research. As Roger shared, you know, he lost his window to study uh, tornadoes in the Midwest by the travel restrictions. Um, but that's an example of, you know, seasonal research, research that has a sensitive time window. Um, uh, if possible, we should prioritize that kind of access uh, for for our uh, researchers to return to campus in phase three. In phase four is now more opening up, uh, maybe it's 50 to two thirds of normal activity, 50% to two thirds and um, allowing, you know, things like uh, term appointment postdocs to have some priority for reaccess to the campus. And phase five is uh, continued expansion, maybe as far as 90%, um, including, uh, you know, sort of getting more people into labs, but not full workforce in the labs and, and applying to tools like scheduling and uh, implementing shifts in order to ensure the right levels of uh, not just social distancing, but also density of activity within our spaces. And then uh, phase six is a return to sort of normal activity, and that's, you know, hopefully 100%. And so uh, in addition, we included in our uh, um, uh, sort of document here, some exemplars from some of the other, other campuses within the University of California, some considerations for ramp up planning from Irvine, um, uh, uh, some uh, density in laboratory guidelines from the University of California, San Francisco, <coughs> excuse me, and then uh, also uh, some uh, draft uh, ramp up guidance from the U University of California, Davis. And finally, you know, really interesting uh, guidance and even checklist components from Stanford about uh, once you're going into a lab that's been closed for a bunch of weeks, what are the things you should do before you go in? Uh, what to look out for when you walk into your lab? how to sequence through returning the instrumentation uh, to normal operating mode if they had been shut down, uh, how to establish schedules for uh, scheduled and shifted access to your lab to maintain low density in university spaces, 
And it's, it's basically a, a very interesting checkoff, uh, uh, you know, sort of sequence that again, would be very useful for informing individual campuses implementation plans. And I think with that, I would like to return the floor to Roger to go on to our next presentation. Uh, thanks very much, Randy. Uh, we're going to hold the questions till the end. So the next up is uh, Mark McClellan. Hey guys, well, thank you for inviting me to join you. Um, it's a great opportunity to catch up. As Roger said, it's not often we have this this chance to share best practices and, and in essence, so many of us, that's what it's all about, right? Um, uh, Randy could not have done a better overview and, and I dare say most of us have, have stood on his shoulders, grabbed many of the principles that he established um, and, and gathered together and, and used it as, as the base of our own operations. So here in Texas, uh, we, we, are, we, are, we are at a different kind of place. We have a govern, governor's proclamation that is opening the state and um, we, are, we are moving forward. Our stay in place order lifts today. This is the last of stay in place. Um, so we have had to move forward with our plans um, uh, a little bit faster pace than maybe we have all would have been necessarily comfortable with, but it's kept us on, on our toes. Um, just to, and I'll give you just a, the briefest of overview of, of our approach on this, and then um, happy to, then I'll take you into a little bit more of our thinking in terms of, of safety. Um, we have, we, as Randy illustrated, we took uh, what we saw there as great suggestions and for us, boiled that down to a four-stage process. And our reopen document that's current as of today is posted here. Um, it's a live document. It literally is changing um, with tons of edits having happened yesterday. Uh, but, but um, you know, you're welcome to, to stay abreast of that. We'll be posting ours live to the web effective Friday uh, because this all goes into play uh, as of tomorrow. Um, we have four stages of operation. Our first one is May 4th, that's next Monday, where we enter into a pre-operational mode. At that point, we're inviting our biological stores, our chem stores, all of our various stores uh, to start reopening, start checking uh, uh, inventory. All of our core laboratories, we're asking them to, to begin uh, looking at bringing their, their equipment online. Uh, checking status of, of uh, uh, inventories uh, and all of our uh, biological systems, our animals and our, our fish, et cetera, all are being now uh, rejuvenated, if you would, all those populations. And that will all start on Monday of, of next week. Um, so that next week really is that pre-operational mode. Friday of next week, May 8th, we enter into a full social distancing research, which is essentially exactly where we ended just before we closed down firmly. Um, people are, are, are familiar with it. They know we were operating under that. Um, it's just now in our, with our new document, we're far more detailed uh, in terms of what our expectations are of principal investigators and how they're to, to approach this. Um, a stage three is a test and trace operation. Uh, this will be done very closely with our Denton uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, we're depending on that partnership is critical for us. Uh, they know we're, we're gonna be working closely with them and it's gonna be um, uh, a work in progress, if you would, as we get into full test and trace. Um, and then finally, our four, fourth stage is is research with um, access to vaccination and how do you approach that. Supporting those four stages and the dis discussion around those are 10 supporting documents to give a, a sort of a rich resource of, of uh, references for researchers to explore and, and to come up to speed with. We are particularly focused on the principal investigator and that principal investigator's uh, um, uh, authority and responsibilities. So let me shift. Now let's talk about safety. 
So in a nutshell, let me remind you, everyone, uh, what we've all learned based on, on the uh, recent court cases um, and the assignment of personal supervisory responsibility, I'll, I'll use that term, where every supervisor has the responsibility to who, where they're in charge and they're the authority over a uh, laboratory, a, a uh, 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 course that they're, they're producing or, or a uh, activity that they're running, they have the, the responsibility to understand the dangers that might in, be in that situation. Um, it's what we would typically call hazard analysis. But, but very simply, you must, if you're going to create a space where you are authority over that uh, activity or space, you must understand what that hazards might exist there. And then as you allow people to come into that space activity or whatever, you must tell them of that hazard. You must train them of that hazard. And then third, um, uh, for, for those of us who sort of watch court cases a little closely on this, it's best to make a record. Those three things, by the way, often get you into the world of indemnification. As a principal investigator, uh, biological, chemical, physical safety that you, you are all thinking of as a, as a principal investigator automatically. But now you have this new one called COVID-19. COVID where you have a high degree of sensitivity uh, among some, some of your individuals that may be in your laboratory space, and you have a general sensitivity amongst all people in that space. So high-risk individuals are, are one category that, that PIs have to be thinking about, and uh, normal operations, normal uh, personnel working in that physical space. The principal investigator to our thinking is still the authority and safety authority of that local uh, laboratory or space. And so it's up to us, the institution, to ensure that that, that uh, principal investigator is sensitive, sensitive and aware and knowledgeable of, of the safety concerns that we have around COVID-19, even in a, a partial startup or in our case, what we call a, a full socially distanced uh, research as our first uh, major operation. Um, I, I can't understand uh, or underscore enough Randy's discussion of the principles. The principles are what guide you stepping forward. And it's important that you all take seriously establishing those principles, either take Randy's and edit them to, to what works, but it helps you later as you walk into how are you going to deal with the safety issues uh, of what you're facing. Uh, your principal investigators are also going to have a lot of pressure. Randy mentioned uh, the possibility of rotation, increasing the, the range on, of times that, that especially graduate students get in, can get in to do that research. And immediately you're facing a far more aggressive concern over safe operations. And whether you use a mandatory check-in system or buddy system, you can't just let it happen. You must proactively go after that and, and look at, at safety. I would be remiss if I didn't say something about high-risk individuals. Because I, I think in, at the end of the day, the first place you have to go is, is maximizing safety for high-risk individuals, age 65 or older, specific health conditions, uh, uh, and, and we all know the list, chronic lung disease, asthma that's, that's significant, heart disease, immunocompromised, uh, uh, um, obesity, diabetes, uh, uh, kidney disease, liver disease, anything that, that like this that you're aware of in individuals or individuals declare them in, in a high-risk category needs to be dealt with. For us, we immediately kick in our HR. Our HR now is already gearing up to step into those situations and, and create uh, alternative space and activity um, that um, uh, can be set up for those individuals. Um, Here's something that principal investigators need to be sensitive to. When you step into that world of asking about high-risk individuals, you're suddenly faced with health information. 
health information that principal investigators must protect uh, and must not share uh, beyond those that absolutely have to have that to ensure the safety of that individual. So that's, that's critically important uh, to keep in mind and, and we stress that in, in our startup document. Um, the last thing I'll mention uh, as we close the time on safety is for principal investigators to sensitize them to be aware of unsafe activities, okay? So what do I mean by that? When you, when you have a situation where you're, where you're starting and maybe using remote uh, social distancing uh, to, to create some remote space between researchers, researchers, particularly um, uh, less experienced researchers, may tend to do things that they simply should not do. Um, and, and they should not do them alone. And, and one thing we can't do is have a social distancing creating a more maximized uh, um, uh, safety uh, concern in another situation. Uh, lifting a large Dewar flask by yourself, you don't do that, you know? And so that takes time to step back, work with the principal investigator, work with the team, and establish a, a safest way to approach that and make those things happen. Well, um, I think, Roger, that's probably a, a, a good overview and, and we can get into questions wherever they may go. Thank you. Roger, you're, you're muted. That has nothing to do with the new technology here. Um, so thank you so much, Mark. Um, and now we move on to Faith. Uh, hello, everybody, and um, thanks, Roger and uh, Randy and others for including the arts and humanities and the non-STEM fields um, in this conversation. I appreciate it very much, as do colleagues from our side of the campus. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of, of um, reminders of the way that the shutdown has impacted folks in those fields that may be distinct from how it has impacted some of the uh, folks in the lab sciences and biomedical fields, um, because that impact has been a little bit different. Uh, one of the things to be aware of is that folks in the arts and humanities uh, and in the social sciences likely have a higher teaching load than their colleagues in the lab sciences. And what that means is this transition to remote teaching has impacted them in a different way than it has folks who, who maybe only teach one class a semester. Um, I have colleagues both at Indiana University and here at UCSD who tried to take, had to take three classes online um, overnight in response to campus shutdowns. And that's a huge lift for them. Um, uh, and, the, I will also say there is great anxiety for among those folks looking to the future as campuses talk about whether or not they will be fully remote, hybrid, or fully in person in the fall. Um, and so, so the teaching strain on these researchers and these scholars is an important one to recognize. Um, secondly, for our colleagues in the performing and studio, studio arts, um, it is hard to underscore or overstate how strong the shutdown has been. Um, a composer can sit in his office and at home and compose, but it's impossible to hear the music played as, as it was intended to be played. And so it's sort of like speaking to an empty room. You have no way of doing that work. A theater director has no actors to direct. Um, and can't do the work. And so it's important to be aware of the impact of the shutdown on those fields. And finally, something that I'll speak about again in another way, um, for particularly for those in the humanities, um, the publication cycle has altered dramatically as a result of the shutdown. And somewhat to my surprise, one of the things that numerous people have reported to me is that editors at university presses and at the top journals are actually pressuring them to be more product productive in this time, partially because those editors fear a, a later reduction of publication. Um, in other words, uh, one, one editor spoke to me about the fact that they anticipate layoffs at their press and they need to get everything into production now in order to have books to publish later. Um, and so they are putting great pressure on their editors, their peer reviewers, and their respondents 
in a way that is probably very ill-timed for those folks uh, right now. So that is a, a huge issue that people are currently facing. As I think about future issues that, that folks in the arts and humanities are going to face, one again is the uncertainty about what the future teaching models are going to look like. Uh, colleagues of mine have said, you know, for this one, I basically took my in-person class and put it on Zoom. If we go hybrid next fall or go to a online mode, um, doing something remotely in the classroom is not the same as doing it online. Online education has, has resources and opportunities that, that many of our faculty members are not availing themselves of now, but will need to learn how to do in the future. That's a huge learning curve in the summer for them that is going to impact their research and scholarship productivity. Um, the big one I heard about from everybody I consulted with was the travel issue. Um, uh, Roger mentioned tornadoes in the Midwest and there is a season for that. Go tornadoes, um, I'm glad not to be in the Midwest anymore. Um, but it is important, I think, to think about the arts and humanities and social sciences as being similarly seasonal. Um, if a, a um, performing artist uh, was planning to direct a premiere at the Williams Williamstown Summer Theater, very high prestige, not going to happen. Um, somebody who was going to perform at Carnegie Hall, very high prestige, almost a form of peer review, not going to happen. Um, so for our performing artists, summer and fall are very productive times for them to travel elsewhere, to, to partner with colleagues, to perform, to direct, to act. That's really shut down and it has them very anxious. For humanists and social scientists, um, many of them compress a full year's worth of data collection, site visits, interviews with communities far across the globe, or time in archives far away into the summer months. That is their sort of data collection time. Uh, and then they, they, they mine that data for all the research they are doing, not only for the following year, but perhaps for several years. Um, in the humanities, in the same way that STEM people might write a five-year proposal to the NSF or the NIH, in the humanities, we have five-year plans for our research that will end in a monograph. And those plans really hinge on collecting that data, being in that archive at a particular time. If you can't do that, the entire five-year plan gets shot. And that's where a lot of our humanists and, and social scientists are right now. They've not only missed this tornado season, they are really worried about their, the impact of missing it for years to come. Um, the second, the last thing is funding. Um, I know, you know, STEM folks laugh when I think about funding in terms of the arts and humanities because for, for, for those of us in these fields, you know, $10,000 is a gold mine. Um, but there is deep concern that those little bits of funding that go a very long way for folks in the arts and humanities are going to be the first to get cut, both by federal governments and by philanthropies and universities. Um, I think that there is, there is a general sense sometimes that the arts and humanities are perhaps the least um, important or practical. And therefore, if I have to choose between giving $10,000 to a group who's trying to find a cure for COVID and $10,000 to somebody to, to figure out a way of interviewing people in a remote community, I'm going to choose the COVID. And there's good reasons for that. But folks are very concerned that even the little bits of funding that they rely on to make it possible for them to do their work are vulnerable. What can core members do? Um, a couple of things. During the ramp up period, please consider the performing arts spaces and studio spaces in much the way you would consider other high priority areas. Um, the dance professor cannot do their work in their home. And much like the postdoc who is coming up against a deadline or other people you might prioritize, these are people um, in the performing arts who really need that access as soon as possible 
to performing spaces, theaters, rehearsal spaces, and studios. Um, don't put all the arts and humanities at the back of that particular ramp up bus. Um, secondly, uh, advocate among your colleagues at your university for a broad reconsideration of tenure and promotion timelines and the criteria for the arts and humanities that would be in place as a result of this pandemic. Um, there's been a lot of discussion of the impact on junior faculty, and that's really important. Um, but a lot of associate and full professors are depending on the production of that monograph for their promotion. And if they get thrown off, as they are likely to be during this time, that's going to impact them really strongly, not just next year, but several years down the line. Um, it, as, as advocates for research and scholarship across the whole university, colleagues in the arts and humanities and social scientists hope you will advocate for flexibility on those guidelines and research and scholarship expectations for them as well as for your colleagues in STEM fields. Um, advocate for continued federal support for the arts and humanities. Um, I haven't seen anything about that in any of the discussions, and I recognize, even as a humanist, it's a fairly low priority when other things are, are coming up, but don't ignore the fact that these, uh, these, these agencies are always vulnerable to attacks and, and being defunded, and they will be more so now, and, and advocates from, from our group will be really important. When a scientist argues for the humanities, it gets more attention than when a humanist argues for the humanities. So please use your voices to do that. And finally, ensure that travel guidelines that your university is developing consider the needs of these people. Um, it's true, the Bodleian Library at Oxford is always going to be there. But the person who needs to go to Oxford to study there may not always have the opportunity. And, may, and, and so if there is a way of ensuring that when it is possible to travel, they are enabled to do so, if you can put your shoulder to that particular wheel, it will help them a lot. That's all I got. So thank, thank you all. Um, before I have just a few comments, because there were some things that I've thought about a lot that I don't think I heard covered only because of the time limitations. I'll just make a comment that I noticed that all the questions that were asked, some very good, have already been answered online. So don't forget there is an answered column that you can click on so that actually we've saved time because our panelists have already gone in there and provided answers. So just a few other things that, and this won't be exhaustive, but I sort of um, noticed we're out, uh, outside of what was mentioned and certainly things I think about. Uh, the general topic of building management. Uh, in terms of, for example, uh, trying to manage when multiple units or multiple departments or divisions have space in one building and trying to separate the priorities uh, there. Um, what if a building is empty and it turns out the people are going to go essentially skip to the front of the line? Uh, I, I got to believe that's going to happen. And there's more than, and then building density in terms of physical distancing or safe distancing. Uh, it's more than just what's in the lab. You might do that correctly in the labs, but you need to think of the common spaces, the hallways, the bathroom. It doesn't do any good if there's 100 people outside the bathroom because you're only allowing two people into each ba bathroom. This is what I put under the general category of building management. I want to also highlight something that I think is in Randy's uh, uh, document about you need to think carefully about 24 hour access, people willing to take the graveyard shift. And I think they will, if they can come back on campus. And also thinking about staggered work days, maybe one group can come in Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, another group can come in Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Uh, I think all of you know this, but graduate students are probably gonna be one of the first groups to come back. But I do wanna highlight that. And there's been a lot of discussion about being sympathetic to students, postdocs, and staff that are in a tiny little apartment and they don't have a good window that looks at nothing but the wall. And so there's a psychological aspect of maybe putting them at first in line because they really need to get out. So I'll throw that out there. Uh, we can't do this in a vacuum. We have to integrate with teaching because we're gonna be the first to occupy the building. What is gonna happen when the doors get open and the students coming back and the professors come back that are doing large lectures. That's going to add to the building density 
And so maybe we, we put the first stake in the ground, but we have to be very careful and work with our partners that have the education uh, mission. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of, again, impacted uh, staff, I, it has come to my attention that we have now flagged a huge disparity and disproportionate effect on early career women uh, because often they are the caretaker at home. And so working at home, even if they can work at home, has now been totally disrupted because they're also trying to take care of kids at the same time. And it has impacted the women faculty more than it has impacted the men. And I want to state that if you didn't realize that. I've heard already lots of stories about that. And I know our privilege and tenure committees are thinking about this uh, a lot. So sorry, I didn't want, I just wanted to take a few minutes, but those are some of the ones that I know hit me pretty hard. And uh, maybe we can start with uh, at least the unanswered question that I see here. Um, Alexis Sand says, on campuses where uh, undergraduates are not required to carry health insurance such as ours, what latitude do we have uh, requiring this of students who return to the lab, unpaid interns, volunteers, as in requiring proof of insurance? Who wants to handle that one? Or do we have an answer to that one? So Randy, you don't want to jump on that? <laughs> So, I mean, I was there at Utah State, um, and, and I think when I left, uh, um, uh, we were estimating 30% of our undergraduates were engaged in, in research, huge amount, and, and to believe, uh, to understand that a, a number are not carrying uh, health insurance in this situation, it would be scary. Um, and, and so, Alexa, I, uh, I think you, I think you keep hitting that horn, uh, that warning horn, and saying this is, this is not a good situation, and we should be very hesitant about um, engaging in them. Uh, that I, I think those undergraduates should follow the teaching guidance as as teaching starts to come onto campus, um, you know. But even there, as you get close in working in a research laboratory. Uh, risks goes up and and I think with undergraduates uh, as we said first and foremost their students yeah and I noticed that there are a bunch of questions about which are generally liability questions related to you know opening up the campus what degree of testing are you doing and what degree of safety are you providing for your campus community it's not just undergraduates it's also everybody else staff under uh, graduate students, postdocs, researchers, and uh, faculty, so these are these are um, uh, important issues. Sorry, these are important issues. Uh, we are in conversation both with our general counsel. Uh, I know there's a very active conversation about this with the other vice chancellors for research in the UC system on on really what are the set of questions to be asking around this and what is the sort of level of uh, proof that we need to uh, develop before, in terms of testing plans and things of that nature before we can allow our community to come back to campus. So those are part of the plans, but a lot of it is, is sort of interpreting legal aspects that are still work in progress. Okay, I see Myrtle, you've asked a good question. What about, I'll just summarize it quickly as what about enforcement? I don't think any of the VPRs want to be police officers, but what are we going to do to sort of manage this situation? Well, I can tell you in, in our case, in my personal case, we, we were the point of control initially for access to campus in that so-called phase two situation, phase one and phase two. And we were overwhelmed, you know, it's just too many people to deal with. Uh, so you do need to have some kind of hierarchical approach and, I think uh, the approach that Stanford is taking uh, is, is a good one, which is uh, to develop plans at the, at the level of individual faculty. So of course it's laboratories, but it could be other kinds of research spaces. And also the librarians consider these sort of things um, uh, in terms of access to archival materials and collections. And roll that into department chairs that develop it for their departments and the department chairs need to coordinate across buildings because departments are spread across buildings, share buildings, uh, aren't always uh, uh, sort of limited to a single building. 
and then it rolls up to deans. And, and if there are any, any sort of issues in the plans, then, then maybe administrators like us get involved by really trying to decentralize it as much as possible. With you know, another aspect of the Stanford plan that I really liked was there is a compliance pledge that faculty have to sign off on when they develop their, their sort of social distancing and space density plans that says, I understand the guidance, I understand the rules, so I'm gonna enforce the rules and I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't. And you know, I understand that's more moral persuasion than, than the, the enforcement of sort of walking the halls, but I hope it carries a lot of weight. Okay, um, I noticed a, a question here by Mark Harris that let's see if I can summarize. Um, Maybe you're asking for a little bit more detail in terms of prioritization beyond the obvious COVID-19 research and early career research. Could you help us out a little bit there? And maybe some more uh, specificity about uh, the UC document that talks about 30 to 50% ramp up, 50 to 70% ramp up, maybe providing a little bit more specificity because that's kind of vague in terms of how you're gonna make the decision. Yeah, this is actually a work in progress for my own campus, which is to convene a task force of experts from the lab sciences, from uh, the performing arts and studio type activities on campus. Uh, so we, we put together about uh, a dozen individuals who represent different kinds of activities and research. Nope, we're losing you, Randy. You might have to turn your video off. And we're asking them, to, uh, I hope you can, can hear me okay now, uh, but it's maybe not. Uh, uh, why don't I try and answer the question by, by typing an answer into the, uh, in, into the Q&A box? Okay, that will work. Let's see. Um... So if I may, uh, lots of questions uh, that are in the open section of the, the Q&A and also uh, we've been trying to answer questions live. There's been a lot of um, questions on the conversation about testing. We anticipated these types of questions and would actually like to try and do some live polling to get a sense of what is happening on each individual campus. Uh, so the goal is we're going to have about four questions and we'll go through them really quickly and share with you some of the results. Uh, so if uh, we could launch the first question. Mm -hmm. The first question is really just allowing us to follow up with you to collect some more detailed information because again, the, these polls are going to be very general at this point. Uh, so the first question is APLU is interested in gathering uh, the institution's capacity. Uh, for testing, and would you like to be contacted for a follow-up? Uh, so please click yes uh, if you want us to reach out to you, uh, and we'll do our best uh, to get back. Uh, so how are we with uh, how many people we have responding to this question? We'll leave it about open for about a minute or so. <clears throat> Yeah, so the idea is that there is another team within CORE that is really looking into this question and wants to do a much deeper dive. Uh, so we hope to use this information to help that team move forward with helping gather information that's helpful for everybody. Okay, so it looks like uh, the poll is now closed. Thank you. Uh, and the second question, if we could launch that one. Uh, this one is what types of COVID related testing capabilities are available at your campus and please select all that apply. Uh, so again, this will help us uh, follow up with you and trying to make sure we um, sort of prioritize the information we want to collect. <clears throat> Bethany, while we're waiting on that, uh, the questions on liability are interesting. And it's one of the reasons why we are, our, our intention is to link very closely with our, our local Department of Health, uh, that they essentially will be guiding all, all steps forward with us in terms of test and trace. 
Okay, thank you. So we've ended that question. Thank you. And we're going to share results for this one. So as you can see from this question, it looks like uh, most of your capabilities are on diagnostic testing. So thank you. All right, the next uh, is question is I think related more to, uh, we'll launch the third question, uh, to the financial support uh, that your institution is receiving. Uh, please select all that apply. Uh, so your institution is providing the support uh, or the state or are there public private partnerships? Are you receiving federal funding uh, for uh, doing testing? Uh, I believe there is language currently in, in multiple types of legislation that allows you to do state and federal uh, funding. Or you uh, don't know, and that's okay also. <clears throat> okay. How are we on, uh, for those who are running the polls, how are we on, uh, make sure you answer soon. Yeah, 10 more seconds. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll show the results as well for this one. <clears throat> okay, we'll share results soon. Uh, so it looks like the majority for the financial question is we do not know what sources are available. Uh, I think that is very common. We are hearing that in multiple conversations and we are trying to respond as best we can to APLU to make sure everybody understands what is available. Uh, so thank you for uh, filling out that poll. And the last one, if we could launch the last question. Uh, where are you in your planning uh, regarding testing? Uh, so your students, faculty, and staff once they return to campus. Uh, so some of you may are just in the beginning phases of starting your planning and discussing. Uh, so maybe some of you are already implementing your plan. So in that case, that would be more of the selection of we have started our planning and completed writing guidance to be shared with the campus community. So you've already sort of moved on to their implementation phase. Uh, or you're not even uh, thinking about it or haven't yet, uh, which I hope many of you have already done. So 10 more seconds. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much for submitting your answers. Uh, it looks like we have started our planning but are still in discussion is the majority. Uh, so I think that we're, uh, again, thank you so much for filling out this information and uh, we'll do our best to follow up with you uh, and getting more detailed information. So thank you. Back to Roger. Yeah, this has been a very interesting process because I think some questions have been play, put online and other people have been answering them, which is fine. Uh, in fact, very effective when other people, we sort of crowdsource the answer. I think one question I could pass on to Jerry, you're asking Mark that he wants to know a little bit more about, you, you mentioned supporting documents that you're putting together. He wants to, if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Right, in the posted plan um, that uh, Bethany's created that space for us to all to put our plans, uh, we posted ours that uh, uh, was edited as of, as of today. As a part of that, there are 10 resource documents connected to that, uh, ranging everything from uh, basics of sanitation, uh, uh, you know, how, how to talk about uh, individuals with, with uh, high risk, um, uh, appropriate PPE and how to use that and how to uh, think about operations with that. Um, uh, finances, how to deal with, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking with a sponsor and understanding what the rules are here at UNT uh, in terms of uh, no work uh, pay on, on grants, uh, things of that sort. So we built it as sort of a a comprehensive live document. Um, uh, we literally are adding these daily uh, to our document and our document uh, will go to our website uh, live as of Friday and then continue to edit and build out from there. Okay. So I'm looking here. I'm not sure I uh, um, see a question that hasn't been addressed either uh, online or is a question. 
Yeah, so uh, it's been very I think fun. that our community is very interesting in using the Q&A as a chat function. So yeah. uh, it's hard to go through the questions. Yeah, I think you, that's, turned, you turned off chat and they found a workaround. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, so Coral uh, actually has asked a question. We are preparing an online training session and are strongly considering to require each person coming back to campus to have this training. Any suggestions where specific training to work under COVID-19 would be available? Mm -hmm. Anybody able to respond to that? I got to think that if a university hasn't figured that out, Carl, I am quite sure that, that corporate America is working on this. Um, and we might be able to, to you know, um, uh, benefit from that experience. You know, if they're in your area is a um, plant or a, um, a large business, I, I know that a family member of mine is having those discussions about where they work and what training they will offer to their staff before they're allowed to return. So that might be one resource. So let me uh, ask the panelists a question because it was asked of me, uh, even though we're sort of still kind of hunkered down in, in a essential research or critical research mode, a number of the animal researchers have asked me, can I forecast when I think things are gonna ramp up and can I go ahead and start ordering animals with something like a two to four week lead time? Is that okay to do? Assuming that, and of course, these animals could still survive if it turns out to be six weeks or seven weeks. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Well, certainly the conversation on our campus is given the uncertainty going forward, um, that we need to enter into an agreement with principal investigators that they're taking some risk. So if they order animals and then we go back into a shutdown and the animals can't be delivered or something like that, they have to understand that uh, they have responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, uh, we uh, what, sorry, go ahead, Faith. Go ahead, Mark. I, I was just going to say we, um, as a part of our pre-open, uh, so effective as of, of uh, Monday, our faculty will be able to start ordering animals, in fact, all supplies. Um, however, of course, they, they'll be, uh, we don't expect uh, personnel uh, to be fully on campus uh, until uh, the following <coughs> week. Um, but uh, it raises a good question because, I, you know, there's no question there is a risk, as Randy said, it's very possible that, that uh, animals could, uh, could arrive in, in a couple of weeks and we could be uh, backtracking a bit here. So it's a, a very fluid situation. And, and I was simply gonna say, I think that the, 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 at, at UCSD, we have worked with our animal care program staff from the start to try to diminish the impact on animal colonies, if not on animal research. And that, that um, that may be a way of framing it. If the animal care staff are able to provide care in compliance with social distancing and safety rules, um, even if the research can't get started, there that may diminish some of the risk that Mark talks about. So again, I am monitoring the Q&A, but uh, maybe to be fair to Faith, I'm gonna ask you a question. Oh, great. <laughs> Performances, exhibits, et cetera. Uh, when they start opening up, and, and we'll obviously have safe distancing or physical distancing, do we open that up to just university personnel? Because there, there's a public component of that. That mm -hmm. is a huge issue. And I think that um, uh, it, it is one I hope that universities are thinking about. Um, and, and, and again, I think that it's, it's got to be done in conversation with both broader public health considerations and university safety considerations. Um, uh, somewhat related to that, Roger, um, at, at UC San Diego, I'm also um, uh, one of the co-chairs of a task force looking at travel guidance during the, the knowing there's going to be a period of time between where we are and, and life goes back to normal. What kind of restrictions every time somebody travels uh, from campus elsewhere and then back, they increase our risk. When we have visitors to campus, 
um, that may increase the risk of transmission. Um, and and you know that my the committee I'm working with has talked about you know admissions office visits, um, and we have also said what about performance spaces on campus that are a real resource for the community. Uh, outside of the campus and and what do we do with those and I think that each campus has to consider that yeah thank you Roger let me I'd like to make a comment because among some of the questions and some of the commentary there, there can be a tendency for VPRs to to maybe point at EHS to be the bad guys to be the compliance enforcers and I'm going to urge you all to refrain from that. Um, urge you all to use the, your bully pulpit and your connection to the academic world as a way to, to create a, a, a social awareness and a social drive for compliance. Um, some of the worst cases, and, I, and I've done a number of safety reviews of, of campuses, the worst cases are usually happen when EHS is made out to be a police force. And, uh, and in some cases actually reported to the police. So um, I, I urge you not to, to take that knee jerk reaction. Instead, uh, use your powerful voice and your communication with your deans and your department chairs to try to enforce compliance that way from, from a social uh, connection perspective. Yeah, I know we have a very close and friendly relationship with EHS on, on our campus. So it has to be a partnership. Okay, Bethany, I wonder if you could help me here. I don't know if I see a question. <laughs> so one of the general themes I'm seeing is, as part of, again, the discussion about testing is um, the legal issues around testing. Uh, I think that um, there was, I can't recall again who it came from, I apologize, uh, the question on uh, can, uh, the cadence of testing and uh, what, uh, I guess, legal liabilities do you need to be considering when testing students and faculty? So can you talk about the legal aspect as well as the cadence question? No, okay. <laughs> We're still all figuring that out. Yeah, I think that's the million dollar question. Yeah, okay. I and mean, I don't think we have the expertise yet to, to answer that. And of course, just the sheer magnitude. Um, if we open up the campus at some level, we've got to test everybody. And, and we've been struggling with that at uh, the University of California system. And, and there've been some interesting suggestions. Randy's nodding his head. We've been talking about how we can scale up in a way that's manageable. Well, and I think that, that one, one element of the conversation, of course, is that testing is not a panacea. Um, it, it tells us that the person you tested did not have evidence of the virus on that day. Um, it doesn't tell you that they didn't have the virus, um, and and you know, so so I think that's one of the discussions or one of the elements of this that makes it so difficult to to land on a cadence or a requirement and feel comfortable that that's going to be enough or supportable. It's necessary but not sufficient, and I think that's the real challenge, right? And of course, as someone else pointed out, some of our most distinguished faculty are in the high risk group, over 65. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's just a fact of life that makes the decision making process even harder. Mm -hmm. What's going to be interesting, too, is the role of, of um, uh, state government, local government, um, and particularly as, as health departments start to, to feel capacity to react and to give guidance. Um, it just uh, it, it will make for a fair uh, patchwork uh, of different steps forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make the point that uh, an interesting statistic that I heard is that 20% of the staff at Berkeley are retirement eligible, which I think means that they're over 50 and they have sufficient years of service to retire or something like that. Um, but we shouldn't forget about that element of our community as we think about ramp up plans. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, the data that we within the University of California system are getting in terms of the COVID-19 testing across our five health centers 
indicate that the largest cohort of COVID positive cases are associated with the youngest demographic likely to be in our campus, the 18 year olds to, I forgot what the high end is, but they are, they actually have a higher incidence of COVID-19 than the, the other demographics that they, they break the data down by. So younger people are more likely to have it. They may not express symptoms, but they could cause problems for the older demographics of faculty and staff. And, and I should amplify what you said, Randy. We, it has been pointed out to me that a lot of the messages and a lot of the things we've focused on have been students and faculty that we have not, I don't know if this is a true on your campus, but staff have not received as much attention. And certainly at UCLA, I've heard that from a few of the people. So we, we just all should be wary of that. They're, they're the, sometimes the forgotten uh, person on campus. So just a warning to all of you out there. So I think this relates to a question that's in the Q&A uh, from Chris about, uh, as Mark pointed out earlier, HR will look to provide accommodations for those individuals uh, who are not, who are more in the staff category. Uh, if this is not possible, uh, if this is not possible either financially or physically, okay, so what, how, how do you um, bring back people who don't want to return to campus uh, for I, many different reasons, whether there's a health risk or if they just can't uh, physically or financially. Are you making accommodations for our people maybe who, uh, again, need to stay home due to taking care of, of uh, children or family? How, how are people thinking through that? Well. I can just answer really quickly when we had a brief discussion about it, we just hope we're in sync when the unified school district opens up mm -hmm. because that's really what's caused the enormous strain. And if we open up, start ramping up way before the school districts will open up, that's gonna cause a problem like you just mentioned. And I think we have to be fairly accommodating to that, but I don't know if others have comments. Some you know, of the, go ahead. I was just gonna say, some of the discussions that I've been in on here in San Diego have, have again said, we have to think about that in a phased way. I think that in the same way during this period of, of stay at home orders, um, we, our stance has been, no one should be required to come to campus if they feel unsafe doing so and, and trying to make every accommodation for folks who say, I just can't, whether it's my children, or I don't trust the, the um, safety measures, et cetera. Um, at, at, as we move into successive stages, I think every, you know, we're all gonna have to figure out how, how much do we stay with that stance between now and the time of life as normal again. Um, and again, it, I think it will vary by university, but also we'll have to take into consideration things like what are the school districts doing? Absolutely. I want to make sure, did we uh, address uh, Melanie Page's question about uh, non-clinical face-to-face human subject research? Um, does anyone have any guidelines they can share around that? Well, again, um, we're trying to develop on our campus through our task force a set of uh, guidance for appropriate density control and, and you know, really activity driven social, guide, uh, social distancing other than the you know, six feet. If you go into a store in San Francisco now, there's a plexiglass window between you and the cashier uh, for the grocery stores that are open and they come out and they kind of wipe down with disinfectant after each customer has gone up to the, you know, sort of paid for their purchase and left. And so I think for uh, you know, non-clinical face-to-face, we need to develop some of those kinds of guidelines for how to do it. And on my task force, I have the chair of our human subjects uh, re uh, experimentation, IRB, to help us define those things. And you know, I, think, I think there is a way to get the right sort of more than six foot distant, but is appropriate for that kind of interaction. Okay. All right, we're still going through as many of the questions as we can. Uh, if you would like to um, ask a question, again, click uh, down below in the Zoom screen, the Q&A icon, and you should get a panel to open up uh, to type in a question. 
And if you see another question that you think is really pertinent and you want to make sure is answered, you can like and upvote that question so that it rises to the top and we can answer that one uh, quickly. Maybe so not. I think another question was about uh, what are the standards being used for cleaning both labs and public spaces? Oh yeah. EPA has a great guidance document. I think CDC also has one. Uh, we chose to link to the EPA one and um, it should be a, a good resource for anyone to follow. There was also a question on, uh, I believe it's from Carl, a concern we are working through is access to public transportation for our researchers coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, not everyone has access to a car. Mm -hmm. I think this question really uh, is related to the fact that, you know, generally our university workforce comes from a, a fairly large geographic area to come back to campus. And so we, we do have to be sensitive, not just to the county authorities, but also, you know, maybe regional authorities in terms of the public health directives. So I can tell you that for the, the, the sort of um, uh, pilot study of return to campus access and a testing plan associated with it that is being developed by the School of Public Health at Berkeley, the first people to talk to is the City of Berkeley Public Health Department, the next is Alameda County, and the next is the six Bay Area counties. So, you know, there is some need for coordination and concurrence uh, generally with, a, with the, the region. And, you know, this, of course, is going to be a challenge uh, in developing these plans going forward. Yeah, one other thing I'll just uh, sneak in. I know at our campus, and believe me, parking's a premium. But for the people that are currently on campus and probably the early stages of ramp up, we've told them, just come in, parking's free. And, and that, that's a big statement on, I think, many of your campuses. It's certainly a huge statement on our campus. At some point, we're going to have to back off on that. But right now, to allow people the greatest flexibility, if they need to drive to campus because of safety reasons and they're concerned, they can pretty much park anywhere on campus. There's another question. Oh, sorry, Mark, did you want to respond to that as well? I was going to say, um, all, also, those of us uh, with research administration teams, um, uh, at, at least in my situation, I'm, I'm choosing to hold all of them on remote operations. Uh, even though we'll be partially starting to open uh, remote distance or, or you know, uh, full social distancing, uh, where possible, uh, if I'm still effective uh, with remote operations, I'm having mo many of my offices stay remote. Uh, no sense in, uh, in, in pushing that. Uh, as, as an added uh, complexity on campus. So I, let's see, I see a question by Carl that he asked, what about researchers that work with aging populations that require access to facilities and basically you can't get the access? How do we handle those situations? Maybe it could be a tenure issue, for example. That's a tough one. Well, I th isn't that you know sort of exactly like the researcher who who couldn't get access to their mice for a long time, and so their their clock is slowed. I, I think that for for P and T, we have to factor those in and recognize there are many contexts in which that's going to be an issue. And mm -hmm. in some of those contexts, it's going to be an issue long after campuses are back at operating mode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and this is, you know, again, related to that principle on the impact on our researchers. Maybe it's not just young researchers, I think is really, you know, part of this question, but that our campus, our campus, you know, sort of review community has to figure out, you know, sort of really how to assess people's progress in, in this, you know, really once in a generation kind of effect. It isn't entirely up to the vice chancellors or vice presidents for research, but it is, it is an administrative um, you know, sort of uh, group priority to really think through how to how to help our, our researchers and faculty get through this. And again, that's going back to my comments earlier, Randy, I think that's where the VCRs and the VPRs can be an advocate um, uh, in, in a way that maybe the academic affairs side of the house may not think about. Um, the other thing I'll say is I was in a discussion yesterday where there was some question about um, how do you socialize 
um, uh, and, and diminish the stigma of somebody saying, during the COVID pandemic, I was really struggling because of childcare or, um, you know, we're going to have to think about the fact that for some, you know, women going through tenure now are stigmatized or fear stigma if they say, I'm moving a little more slowly because I've got childcare responsibilities or elder care responsibilities. Those stigmas are going to be attached to this period as well. And I would hope that, that core members would be among the advocates saying, there should be no stigma attached with this. You were impacted, claim it, own it, and committees have to, to account for it rather than say, oh, she's just a whiner. You know, um, Faith, we, we wrote uh, one of our special topics on this, and I think you're absolutely right. Uh, as Roger said too, we need to put a flag in the ground and, and own this is something that we're sensitive to. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it is often uh, women uh, faculty member, but others too, males who are caregivers. Um, and it's not just for children, but for elderly. And, exactly. and I think the more we can take ownership of this and <clears throat> it's a, a live topic, uh, you know, the, the more important we can carry some of that message that we need to be sensitive to this. And, and I would even broaden that, Mark, since there are no questions, I'll just get on my pulpit for a minute. Um, and, and say, you know, to some degree, um, I, think, I think as a culture, we've done a good job of being attentive to child care issues and elder care issues and things like that. I worry we've been less attentive to the fact that, that even those of us without children at home or without a parent at home that we're caring for, we're being impacted by anxiety and, and, and other factors. Um, and that should also be something that we are say, you know, saying, no, you don't get a free pass if you have kids, but if you didn't, you were supposed to get through this just fine. Um, and and I, I hope we will look at the research that is absolutely going to be done in the social and behavioral sciences about the impact of this time on the mental health and the physical well-being of a wide variety of people and put that into play in our conversations around issues of promotion and tenure, um, because I think it's a valid and, and important thing to pay attention to. If I can jump in also sure. in, in, uh, as, as maybe a practice to suggest is I have sent out uh, basically a survey to the faculty to try and understand what the implications of the shutdown have been to people's research progress. And the plan is to extract from that sort of general issues that have arisen, not specific cases, but general ones, like uh, delayed renovations in laboratories, uh, loss of an animal colony, that dollars could potentially help make people whole afterwards. And the idea is to use this as the basis for discussions with our philanthropic community because basically all of our universities are broke right now. Um, but, you know, trying to collect, get the theme of helping us restart is, is resonating very strongly with the philanthropist community. And when it comes to how you would spend the money, it's travel grants for humanists who are not able to travel to their you know, study site. Uh, uh, things like, uh, you know, sort of spending some money to prioritize renovation for promised lab renovations. Uh, lost reagents. You know, I'm looking for those kinds of categories uh, right. in order to put in place a fair and transparent process for how to allocate whatever funds we can bring in the door for that. Uh, but I think you know, doing that on campuses is, is really a, a really good idea. So I want to interject. We have only a few minutes left till we reach the hour mark. Uh, so one last question from Tanju relating to uh, per, uh, research support personnel to be expected to report back to campus. So this was, uh, again, that question about who to prioritize to bring back and when, of course, given the other uh, externalities that they're uh, experiencing. And I think that this is also important. Um, there is under the resources of the shared folder, there is a document that helps describe uh, how you can coordinate and work with your IT group, uh, especially as you begin your uh, ramping up your research again. Uh, so uh, would any of the panelists like to speak about 
research personnel, research support personnel, or your communications and working with IT? Just a lot of nods, okay. Well, what I, what I would say is it's very complicated. Uh, in the UC system, we had, uh, you know, uh, an ability to apply uh, administrative paid leave so people could stay home. That's, you know, sort of passed over probably at this point. Uh, those who can work remotely and are comfortable working remotely should work remotely. Uh, and, and managers should be sensitive to creating, you know, sensitive to needs like an elderly staff member who does not feel comfortable coming in and doing their work um, in the current situation, we need to be sensitive to be able to assign to them work that they can do remotely. But we understand that not everybody can work remotely. Uh, and, uh, and these are very deep conversations to have where there's no clear answer all the time uh, in terms of how to deal with them. Bethany, one of the things I think we need to, to say, and, and um, I posted uh, our outline, uh, our document, anyone is willing to take any part of it. it it's free, yeah, it's yours. Don't, don't feel like there, there's anything proprietary there. We're sort of all in this together. So, uh, um, you know, uh, take what you need uh, from these. Great, right, thank you. And so with that, I'll hand it back to, to Roger to have the last word. This, uh, thank you so much. Um, like I said, I, I know VPRs and VCRs are so ingenious how they worked around the question and answered and turned it into a pseudo chat. I, I, I never cease to be amazed by the people I work with at CORE. You guys are a wonderful bunch. I want to thank the panelists. This was, I thought, a, a great discussion, but you guys will all vote with your feet. I suppose at some point there'll be a poll goes out as to how this session went. I suppose anyone else who's going to be in the driver's seat because we were the guinea pigs, I'll tell you, don't be scared. I, I think I could have done better in a second time, but this wasn't so bad actually at all. So thanks again. Uh, Bethany, any last words? Uh, again, just a heads up uh, for a reminder. Uh, next week's conversation is again going to be in a webinar format. Do not use our normal core weekly Zoom meeting login. You need to register for next week's uh, webinar and get a different login information. I recognize that, that was an issue today and we tried to communicate that. Uh, and please again, put any of your plans in the shared folder. Uh, again, that was sent through the listserv. Uh, the shared folder is intended for uh, core members. And so that's why we're sharing it through the listserv and not through the video today, because we don't want that to be recorded and then shared publicly. Uh, so please uh, upload your uh, plans so that we can use that as a crowdsourcing way to find out what are our best practices. Uh, and I believe that's all I have. Uh, thank you again so much for the conversation. And uh, next week should be interesting as well because we'll talk about numbers. <laughs> okay, thank you guys so much. We appreciate your time today. Thanks everyone.